Good evening. So just to make sure that all of you are still awake, we'll have a small exercise. I'd like all of you to stand up. All right, put your hands up. OK, now I can tell everyone at home I got a standing ovation. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> All right, sit down. Thank you. <laughs> All right. I'm here to talk to you today about hypothetical situations, right? So in architecture school, it's a five-year course back in India. So undergrad is five years. And throughout those five years, the professors always tell you, Explore as much as you can in these five years, because once you graduate, all you're going to do is bathroom details and staircase details. So they scare you. So you know, in those five years, you just try and do whatever you can. You build castles in the sky. Now I'm here to dispel that myth, and I'm going to show you about four projects which all started as hypothetical situations, and they're all being built for the real world right now. Right? Let's go back to how it all started. That's me when I was six years old. I've been at construction sites every summer holidays with my father for the, I don't know, as far back as I can remember. So I've been interacting with laborers, trying to understand how buildings came to be. And from the very young age, I knew this is what I want to do. Construction is what I want to do. It's in my blood. And from that, maybe about 10 years later, I started architecture from, you know, when I was 17, I started architecture school. And when I was in my third year of architecture school, I was about 18 years old, I heard about this competition to design concepts for a hospital project. Very big hospital, 1,500 bed, million dollar project, but it was only for concepts, right? And they wanted student ideas because they wanted fresh ideas. So I was like, okay, fine, no fear. Let's, you know, there's nothing to lose. Ended up entering. Two months later, they say, you won, you won the project. So very happy. And I was like, OK, great, went, got the award. A Couple of months after that, I get a call from the board of directors saying, actually, we love the concept so much, we'd like you to come on board and help us build the actual thing. Now, I didn't know anything, right? I don't have an architectural license yet. And all I did was just design concepts. So I was like, OK, fine. Let me see what I can do. Instead of going back to the books and do doing case studies, I spent one whole year in hospitals in and around Bangalore. Bangalore's in the south of India. Interviewing doctors, patients. I went into OTs, uh, asked them everything that they disliked and liked about hospitals. What would you like to change? Everything. So for a whole year, we did this intense research. And we came up, I taught myself all the programs because we were discouraged from using computer programs back in school. So we had hand draft everything. So I taught myself AutoCAD and all the different programs that we needed to learn. And we prepared drawings. We hired local architects to sign off on the drawings. And before you knew it, construction had started. And I was 19 years old. I couldn't believe it. And when the first slab was being cast, I had an exam. That, that the next day, and they asked me to fly out. So I had to choose between giving an exam or seeing, just like how Nicholas mentioned, something that you've seen on a computer screen or in, the, in, your, in your mind's eye come to, shape, come to shape, actually see it. So I decided to forego the exam, and I flew across, and this is what I saw, right? And you had tears in your eyes. You're a 19 year old kid, you know, all, everything you've designed, you're actually walking through those halls. Before you knew it, in a year, year and a half, I stood in that same spot, a completed hospital. <laughs> what was once this was a completed ICU. And then a couple of months later, we realized this was the first hospital in India that got international accreditation. The first hospital designed by a kid didn't have an architectural license. So the biggest thing that we took away from that, as in at that point, you're like, yeah, we're a firm with this or that. It's just one kid with a laptop running around trying to make something happen. Occam's razor, right? All the doctors, when they diagnose, this is what they stick to. Usually, the simplest solutions are the most often are the right solutions. So if it's a common cold, nobody's going to say it's cancer. You know? So everybody, it's always the simplest solution. That's how they diagnose problems. So we use that exact same principle in all our projects from then on. 
making sure that it's not necessarily about the form or any of it. It's just how, what are the problems with the building and how you can solve it in terms of the context. Using that in mind, I want to take you through a couple of projects. The final year of architecture school, about to graduate fifth year, the Bangalore airport, the international airport, had reached capacity, right? Complete. So they floated another competition called Vision Air. And it was, again, a, a college competition. All the kids in, uh, were supposed to you know, present concepts and things like that. And I, at that time, had actually already set up, and we were doing hospitals, and we were doing all kinds of things while I was studying and giving my thesis. So I had no time. But one of my classmates is like, you know, Shetty, we should do this. We should go. And I was like, OK, fine, let's do it. And up until we had two months to prepare, just in typical architecture fashion, we didn't do anything. For the whole two months, the night before, we're sitting and we're struggling about, OK, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Uh, this is the context of the airport. But yeah, we came up with this sketch the night before. We were like, OK, fine. You know, and we discussed concepts. We discussed how. And from that sketch, we sat for like 12 hours all night, put together a presentation, and we transformed that sketch into that. And we were really happy with the results. You know, it was beautiful in terms of it connected exactly to the metro. We had all the connectivity issues. We had everything figured out, and we were very happy about it. We presented it, got a round of applause, everything, and then we were waiting to hear back from the results, and uh, we didn't win. We came third. That's me and him in the background looking sorry faces. <laughs> I was like, I can't believe we didn't win. As you know, fate would have it. A week later, they call us up and say, you know, you guys didn't win, but you all had the most practical concepts. So we'd like you to come on board and help us design the actual airport. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> this is crazy. So this is the new airport, the expansion. And it's, so this was the proposal that we gave. This is what the airport looks like, all improvised. This is the sketch that we gave in the airport. So we had, at age 20, 21, you're part of a million, million dollar project. Couldn't be happier. No credit. It was like, all right, no worries. Move on to the next one. The most important part about India you need to remember is it's in a state of constant flux. Right? Every day, things change constantly. If one day this road is a one way in this direction, the next day it's the other direction. The minute it starts raining, all the cities shut down, floods, all kinds of things happen. So what if we designed architecture to be extremely adaptive? What if it could change with the context, with circumstances? And the best example to illustrate this, but it's not the best example in terms of performance, are slums, right? Because slums are usually are the modern day nomads. Most people who live in slums are laborers, right? So they come in, they set up these temporary structures, usually next to a huge you know, construction development, and they work out, and it's terrible living conditions, right? You have these thatched roofs, it's built on the, on the ground, so when, it's rain, water, when it rains, water floods, and they cook inside that. So you have this big tarp and this carbon monoxide poisoning. And because I, was, I spent so much time at construction sites, I understood that, oh my god, this is crazy. And these people are living so badly. So we, go, we went in for about a year, year and a half. We did a lot of research. This is a Google map image of one of, so what you see in this stop, this entire area is a huge IT park, right? Because Bangalore is like the IT hub of India. It's called Bagmane Tech Park. Beautiful wide roads, millions of dollars in construction, artificial lakes built, all of that happening. Just below it, in pink, 200 slum dwellers, houses. Each house has about four people. Just below, just behind it. So nobody sees it. Everybody drives on this road, and it's like, wow, Bangalore, India shining, all of that. But behind it, you have this huge slum, right? And the green is all the trash from the slum. And it's like, it's a breeding ground for disease, bacteria, and all of this. And nobody thinks about this anymore. Now architecture is all about building the highest building, the most grand building, put up a huge wall, and it's done. Nobody cares about what's happening behind that wall, around that wall. There's absolutely no social infrastructure that nobody's giving thought to it. 
So we went in as part of uh, what we do now is with every new project we get, we divert about 50% of the funds to educate children. Right? So these are the children we started to adopt through an academic adoption program. And now the second step that we're doing is we're building, we're reimagining slum housing. And, you, and we subsidize the entire cost of the, entire, of, of the housing so that the slum dwellers can purchase their own house for less than 10,000 rupees. Right? So what this ha help does is the house can actually be set up in under six hours, collapse back, and move. So these construction laborers, if they move from one site to another, they can set up the house, live there for maybe a year, year and a half, come back down, and it's all done with sustainable materials. We went and we, four people live in a 100 square foot house. 10 feet by 10 feet. Four people, right? And they live comfortably. Imagine now how you live, right? So next, what we did was, how do we come up with an ingenious slum housing system? We take scaffolding poles. You've seen scaffolding, right, on the side of a building that they used to paint? You take nine poles, set them up, brace the poles, and now because you have constant flooding or rat problems, you take reclaimed jungle wood, you create a raft one foot above the ground. So any kind of water completely goes underneath. Then you use bamboo. Bamboo is the most sustainable building material there is. It grows at an ex extremely fast rate, very, very normal in terms of price, and it's local to India. So you clad the entire site with bamboo. It's a porous material, so air is always flowing through. Even if you cook inside the house, there's no carbon monoxide poisoning. It doesn't get hot. There's constant air circulation. Put a sliding door, a roof with an incline so you can rainwater harvest. And then when you turn it to the side, you have this little extra bit jutting out on the corner, right there. You flip two together, you get a pitched house. And both families can cook over here, mingle, talk about the day, put them all together. And now we're about to roll out housing for about 100 families by the end of next month. We've got all the funding. Last project I want to talk to you about, it's all about TEDx. Now, to have this beautiful talk, we have this wonderful library and museum and all of this happening. What if the art of storytelling is the oldest art, right? Everybody would sit around a campfire, share stories, tell each other about all kinds of things. I caught this big fish, I caught that, I did this, I hunted this, all of that. What if you could design an environment that was so mobile or adaptive that you could have a TEDx conference anywhere in the world, irrespective of terrain, irrespective of anything, climate conditions, any of it. So this was our, my final project at Columbia University with a couple of my classmates, which we're now developing. How could you make a, a performance center deployable, low cost, all inclusive, which means it had to generate its own electricity, and flexible because you have different kinds of terrain, right? You have slopes, you have, you know, whatever, water, all of that. Looked at the world map. These are shipping routes. Then we realized the actual logistics of moving something from one part of the world to another part of the world has already been figured out, right? You already know that a shipping container, it can be put on a ship on a barge, it can be put on the back of a truck, which we've seen a lot in Muscat. You can be airlifted. It can be put on the back of a train. So there's nowhere that a shipping container cannot reach. So we figured out the logistics. Then we realized, OK, how are we going to be able to fit an actual auditorium into a shipping container? How does it work? Do we put the seat separately? Do we do this separately? Do we do that? How does it work? And after a lot of permutations and combinations, we were like, OK, what if the shipping container itself was the auditorium, right? This is what we came up with.
So in four hours, with just four people, this 40-foot shipping container converts into a 250-seat auditorium. And it has a complete shade sail. So what the shade sail is, it's canvas with photovoltaic cells sewn in. We're working with the army with photovoltaic cells sewn into the fabric. So it generates its own electricity, so it's completely off the grid. That means you can put it in the middle of the desert and have a TEDx conference. It'll, you know, it'll support your light, your visual, your camera, all of it. And you have different kinds of configurations. If you want only a half open, you can do it. You can you want to rent it for a wedding, you can rent it for a wedding. You know, you can put it anywhere you want. And the feedback has been, so, we're just finishing up the prototype now, we're going to, you know, going on a world tour, you know, opening it in Copenhagen and London. The feedback has been so good that we've started, it's, it's, we're calling it the black box theater. We're calling it now, we're working on a black box school and a black box clinic. And in India, the most, the largest network is the network of trains, right? So we have this concept where you have this clinic that being put at the back of a train, it's dropped off at one village, you administer medical care, the next train comes, picks it up, keeps going. Right? So all of these <laughs> all of these concepts, every single one of them started off as just concepts. That's it. Just putting a pen to a piece of paper thinking, okay, fine, what if? And now all of them are being developed for the real world. So whatever happens, don't be afraid to think outside the box. Even if the box, you know, is a 40-foot shipping container. Thank you.